epic journey around a vast and wild continent. 167 cars taking off on a rally which would last two weeks and cover 20,000 kilometers. over scorching deserts and alpine snow, through lush rainforest and drought-stricken bushland. An endurance test of man and machine, with the challenge of conquering the most unforgiving continent in the world. There were entrants from all over the world there that Sunday, including some of the most illustrious names in motorsport. The German ace, Edgar Hermann, in a Porsche. The first car away at the start of a marathon which would be his entire life for the next two weeks. The Scottish farmer, Andrew Cowan, the greatest long-distance driver in the world and winner of the two London to Sydney car rallies. Californian state champion, Steve Mizell, in a tough-looking Chevy Blazer. The Canadian rally team, in a Mercedes, with Helen Freeze as navigator one of the 19 women in the event. There were cars of all shapes, sizes and makes. Minimokes, trucks, a 2.5 Riley, a 1948 Ford, a Peugeot 203. Well-prepared rally cars, and not at all prepared family cars. Some out for a drive around Australia's highways, others to prove that they could tackle some of the worst terrain in the world and still come out winners. Some people's rallies were harder than others. Triple Australian rally champion Ross Dunkerton in a Volvo didn't even manage the start without a hitch, an omen of what lay ahead on his troublesome trip. Marlborough Holden, Rothman's Ford, opposing companies, opposing teams. Race and rally champion Colin Bond with a super fast Cortina, looking at that stage well and truly ready for the ensuing fight against the general. Racing champion Peter Brock, carrying that ultimate symbol of relaxation, a fishing rod. Making his debut in long-distance rally, seemed relaxed and confident as he left the start. The flying Finn, Rono Altonen, paired with Kenyan driver Shaker Meta, twice winner of the tough East African safari. This replica is four times as long for a start. Then the safari, we have uh, detailed practice. We go around the route several times beforehand. Um, there are no surprises for us as to where the rocks are going to be or where the sand is going to be, whereas the repco it will be a blind event for us. We're just going to beat the clock and the conditions, and this means that there might be a 50 to 100 meter stretch, which is difficult, and this might uh, decide the rally, which sounds funny when you have 20,000 kilometers to go, but it's often just the one spot which is difficult, which might just cut you off it. <laughs> the tortoise and the hare. The stage ran partly over good open road and partly over a rutted and narrow track. This first special stage was timed to the second and set the running order for the cars until they would be regrouped in Adelaide in order of points lost. A muddy and sleepless 1,700 kilometers away. The organizers had planned a shakedown stage to put the drivers on their toes right from the start. They stated no one would cover the distance in the time allowed. In fact, three cars cleaned the section, setting a hot pace early in a long event. 
After their initial service and a quick meal break, the first cars headed off for a long night's driving towards Mount Gambia and Renmark. And before the day was out, there would be three more special stages. The right hand turn down at the end of the highway. About 500 metres from now. 400 metres. 300 metres. 200 metres. Right turn off the highway. 100 metres. 50. Turn right now. And you've got straight on for 600 metres and a bad creek crossing. Turn right. To set up and plan the repco had taken the organisers two years of hard work. Every metre of the course was logged in the official route books, handed out to competitors. Every twist and corner, every gate and creek crossing. Some of the roads were little more than ill-defined tracks, often with a notice reading, four-wheel drive only. Every kilometre held unknown hazards for the entrance and their carefully prepared cars. differs to the car bought off a showroom floor. Invariably the engine will have been modified, a limited slip differential used, a stronger gearbox and clutch, special tires, roll bars in case of rollovers. Harnesses and navigational equipment are all part of a standard rally car. The back seats are generally removed to decrease weight and make space for tools and tires and for a long distance event anything up to a 40 gallon petrol tank will be built into the boot. To prepare a rally car is a time-consuming and expensive business. At an average cost of $10,000 for each car entered in the Ripco, there was a lot of money taking off on a trip around Australia, with a strong chance of ending in the bottom of a boulder-strewn creek bed or stranded in the middle of the desert. Every driver has a different method of coping with the more difficult terrain, particularly the hundreds of water-filled creek crossings which were part of the rally route. Some were fast, some were slow. And some, as in the case of Peter Brock, were almost instinctive. Yeah, leapt her through, blind her up, leapt her through, I don't know any other way. A little later on, it was more a question of pushing than leaping, when what had been a dry road turned into a quagmire overnight. It caused a 60-kilometre glue pot of mud. So deep, Herman's Porsche had mud coming in through the windows. The mud becoming increasingly more impassable as each car got more firmly bogged. Cars lost an irretrievable amount of time, some up to five hours. A local farmer spent an entire day towing bogged cars out of the mud with his tractor, picking up a cool $1,000 for his pains. In our position in the front of the field, it's very difficult to keep an eye on the other blokes. You, you don't know what times they're setting, you, you can only sort of tell when they catch up to you what's going on. The early leader, Jeff Portman, was still holding off the factory teams. It was just the beginning of the fight between the General and Ford as they passed through South Australia. Andrew Cowan was well placed, ready to move up when an opportunity presented itself. As was Doug Stewart, an expert long distance driver. The factory teams and privateers are at opposite ends of the scale. 
The Marlboro Holden dealer team spent a year working on the cars and planning the backup and service facilities. It was a mammoth undertaking. But privateers also will spend months working on their cars in their spare time. To enter a well-prepared private car with a three-man crew and expenses during the rally could cost $30,000. Portman was still leading from Brock, Ferguson and Bond as they came into Adelaide. But for how long? Um, in our position, we've had it fairly easy. We took the lead at the two-break stage, and we've had the front running. Cars back around 30 and 40 and 50 would have been winching quite a deal, and I believe they have been. Yeah, there were 60 cars bogged at uh, Bordertown this morning. You found no problems there when you went through? No, we didn't. Uh, I believe there was one farmer there making $25 a, a tow pulling people out. How do you expect to uh, navigate the next section? Well, we'll leave in front and we'll try and maintain that position. Maybe we might swap it with Peter. Two or three cars, we'll swap, swap positions like we have been and we'll see what happens when we get to Perth. Tuesday morning, 4,672 kilometres to Perth, the hard way. With only four hours rest, and once more it was competitive almost all the way. Unsung heroes of any event are the control officials and the hundreds of volunteers who make a rally possible. Time controls and passage controls are set up around the course. They're opened long before the first car is due in, and sometimes it can take 24 hours before the last of the battle-scarred vehicles will appear at the end of a special stage. The officials must make sure that the correct in and out time of each car is entered on their route cards. Freezing cold, the heat, wind, sun and rain. Oh no, go away. They sit around with their thermoses and sandwiches. It's a thankless task, particularly when an irate driver is banging on the table shouting about the time he's been given. The press ran their own rally, keeping up with the cars, following the action by light aircraft, helicopter, and occasionally by car. Fabulous, a beautiful basin and a little bit of dirt. Uh, after yesterday, it was heaven. The mud and, the, and that uh, sand, I think it was 40 miles of sand. It shook the car to bits. Yeah, how did that compare with the old days, the 50s? Well, the roads were just as rough then. They haven't made them any better, like their bush roads, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, oh, we have a ton of fun. What's ahead, Jack? Have you got any explosives or anything like that? Uh, the left yeah, the jelly's in the back. Oh, you're yeah. okay. We'd have had some this morning, but we didn't have any time to do it, you know, and there was nobody about, so uh, yeah, all was police in Adelaide. I oh, will have some fun further out the track in, OK? Good luck. OK, okay thanks. Five, four, three, two, one, you're off. Five, four, three, two, one, good luck. Already by the second day, the back runners were beginning to suffer. Just being a short way behind could be an incredible disadvantage. Barry Lloyd explains why. Well, the road surface has become tremendously chewed up. When you were coming out of creek crossings, the earlier cars had torn up the surface of the ground so that you couldn't accelerate because of these tremendous corrugations caused by earlier cars' wheel spins. The Flinders Rangers and the crews with untried cars were finding it hard going. Yeah, back shocks, mate. The, uh, the shocks just keep throwing it in. We've got plenty of spares, but at the end of every second special stage, we've got to change them. There were many gates around the rally route. 
Some pushed open, some fell open, some hardly opened at all, and some, as in the case of Ross Dunkerton, were bashed open, with a little help from amateur navigator Peter Mackay. There were 385 gates in this particular event, which had to be opened and closed. Uh, for not closing, there was a penalty. We were catching this car because it was uh, not going as quick as we were. And each time that we came to a gate, the co-driver of the other car was just closing the gate. I gave the car a few more uh, revs and uh, hit the gate as the, the man was closing it, which threw the uh, co-driver onto the ground. <coughs> I ran into the back of the car, which was through the gate at that time, and away we went two, three kilometres up the road. Another gate, I said, turned round. Lo and behold, no Peter McKay. When I'd hit the gate, he thought that he had to close it, so he jumped out, raced around to close the gate, and we'd driven off. So we had to turn around and go back and pick him up. And he was sort of sprinting his way to Maree, which was about a, a 600 kilometre sprint. It's easier for the men, I think, in the fact that they can get sponsorship easier than the girls can. But put it back down onto our level. We've got full sponsorship and it's made it so much easier for us. We'll have no trouble competing with the men because our cars are as well prepared as any of the men's crews are. Everything's been special. Canbrook have been special because they're the only sole sponsors. Uh, we're one of very few all-girl crews. And also we've got a very special service crew which are really good. I think it's just a matter of getting used to each other because none of us have crewed together before. I've got mother and husband at home looking after the daughter. We're going out there to be as good as everybody else and to certainly come back winners, hopefully, but... But unfortunately, the girls were one of the 40 casualties who didn't make it beyond Perth. Their clutch burnt out at Eucla, and like many others, they were left sitting, waiting, in the middle of the desolate countryside. back country town suddenly swamped by cars and crews. Ross Dunkerton, whose car had caused him so many problems that he'd wanted to retire at Adelaide. We're off to Tarkul now in two minutes to start today's daylight sections and then all of tonight, tomorrow sometime we'll get to... Um, is that right? Tomorrow sometime. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow sometime. And now it was on for the Nullarbor, a navigator's nightmare of winding tracks through the Maralinga rocket range and along the transcontinental railway line. Outside Kalgoorlie, a service crew grabs some badly needed sleep waiting for their car. Colossal, and time seemed to go quite quickly as the event wore on. You know, the sun would come up and you'd go on for a little while and the sun would go down again, and, and uh, shortly after that the sun would come up again, and it all seemed much shorter than the clock actually showed that it had been. Portman had lost his lead across the Nullarbor. The top positions were General Motors and Ford, with Volvo close behind. The machinery's not the same and we don't go as quick as they do. No, we're in a good position now. And uh, there's two very strong teams up there. They're going to cut each other to pieces and uh, we're just going to sit back and hope they do. Well, it's always good to see a battle royal, regardless of who it's between. And uh, yes, we've got a forward battle and a holding battle here on our hands. And you're looking forward to it continuing? Absolutely. And I'm Any... sure it will continue all the way around. It's all been very, very rough. It's all been very, very rocky, and there are guys strewn out all over the place with busted wheels and busted suspension units and uh, the whole bit. You know, it's pretty hard to remember. We haven't had any sleep for uh, since last, whenever we started. Narragin, the last special stage before Perth. 15 minutes to do 25-odd kilometres. How are you going to go? <laughs> well, we're not sure around here. I think it just follows the railway line all the way down. The railway looks fairly narrow and it's got humps and all sorts of things in it but um, it'll be interesting I think the people here watching will be um, give them something to see as well there he goes.
compare this to the last big one you were in, the London to Sydney? Long, long, long way harder. Not, not twice as hard, much more than that. This, this is a real rally. Um, the times, they can't make them any tighter than the legal speed limit, but what they do is pick worse roads. Perth, an exclusion control. In order to stay in the trial, the cars had to reach Adelaide, Perth, Darwin, Townsville, Sydney and Albury within their time limit. And some of them were only just making it. Only the cars in front were getting enough service, rest and food. For the others, it was just a matter of hanging on. Wanneroo, a special stage round a race circuit. Two of the top drivers came to grief. Portman rolled on the circuit and bombed after leaving it. The race was on again. Up the rough, sandy coastal road towards Geraldton. 4,750 kilometres to Darwin in 50 hours. But the drivers still had time for some ribald humour and rally stories. Barry Lloyd had a brief moment of glory. We thought it was extremely funny that Colin Bond came to this dreadfully rough boulder strewn river crossing and saw our car on the far side of the crossing and thought, oh, that must be an easy crossing because the boys in the little cult have made it across and proceeded into the thing at about 20 miles an hour, which was five times too fast and they leapt and crashed from boulder to boulder and finally expired in the middle of the river with water deluging all over their electrics. On they went past the pinnacles in Western Australia. The rock-strewn tracks giving way to wide, fast roads where speed really counted. Shit, that was quick. Five positions were Holden and Ford, hotly pursued by Cow and Citroen, Frank Johnson and Ross Dunkerton in their Volvos not far behind. Police. Sometimes a problem, but not during the Repco. We had no trouble with the police force. They were all very for the event, and um, if we had been uh, knocked off twice, we were excluded from the event. So. It was a very careful thing when you were going through towns to make sure that you were doing the right thing. Doug Stewart, whose rally ended in the great sandy desert when a clutch lining disintegrated. Followed by a dispirited Colin Bond. Just after Wanneroo, we just took off and um, there was a T-junction. We went straight ahead at it and rolled the car. The car was OK, exactly. It you know, sort of pushed the roof around a bit and smashed the windscreen, but um, we lost 15 minutes on that section. So you're going to but, keep going with it? Uh, we keep going, but we've also got a problem with the um, steering racks come up and hit the sump. And I think one of the conrods must be hitting it, so all we've got to do is just go somewhere and uh, see if we can fix it, OK? We haven't got a service crew here, which is a problem. We've just got to go up the road somewhere and see if we can uh, do something up there. Geraldton. All three Fords up in the air. Frenetic activity as people work against the clock to get the cars on the road again. Engine mounts and suspension had caused all three to drop time, and the Commodores were beginning to assert their lead. By Port Headland, it was obvious that many of the leading cars were in serious trouble. Only the Holden Commodores came through on time, hours before the next car. Uh, our cars come through all right. We're in the process now of going through a lot of preventative service. Uh, so that we don't have troubles, and uh, I can't say much more than that on that section. Are you expecting it to be a lot easier from here on? Uh, no, it probably gets harder in my opinion, even though the roads might get easier, it gets harder, especially if you're leading the rally. Cowan's rear suspension had broken. They were battling for fourth place. 
Yeah, it was ridiculous, you know, that car number 195 should be allowed out on the section ahead of us. And we followed them for 350 kilometres and we eventually got past because they stopped to put a can of petrol in. It's cost us 27 minutes. The first competitive section was the good parlour stage, just a small part of the 2,839 kilometres to Townsville. The red soil and harsh landscape would soon give way to bulldust and then tropical rainforest. Now the casualties were coming thick and fast as more and more drivers bombed out. Bond, after making the Darwin control with 30 seconds to spare, was out. Cowan Citroen, lying fourth and ready to make his move up front, gave up the ghost only a short way into the first stage when his drive shaft broke. The two rallies, leaders and backrunners, seemed to be worlds apart. Now, Andrew Cowan, I've known for years and been in the London Sydney Marathon with him. I never met him once in the rally, not from the start to the finish. So I, the last I heard him was carving his name on a tree trunk somewhere. <laughs> the hard and relentless pace. Everybody drawing on their last reserves for the courage to go on. Hallucinations. Monsters creeping over the windscreen and crazy kaleidoscopic visions. Every time the car lurched, I immediately came awake and made a grab for a non-existent steering wheel because I thought I was driving. We were coming up to a, uh, a mountain in the distance. It was like having zoom binoculars up to your eyes. The mountain was going in and out, long distance, short distance, long distance, short distance. At that point, I got out of the seat. You can be going along a straight road, and you'd be convinced that you're going downhill, and you're continuously putting your foot on the brake to slow down. And uh, you eventually come down to sort of 30 miles an hour. You don't run off the road or anything. You just have this hallucination that you're, you're traveling downhill at a tremendous rate. You've got to slow down, slow down, slow down. Cold cloths squeezed over their heads to keep them awake. Moving mountains, an unreal distortion of sight and sound. Get stuck, winch out, get in, drive on. Get stuck, winch out, get in, drive on. And it's not just tiredness which is getting to them. From Darwin to Mount Isa, they've been plagued by bull dust. It's everywhere, in their cars, in their clothing, and in their throats. We knew what we were getting into. You know, there's a lot of desert out here. We saw a lot of people out there who were in fully sealed vehicles, and uh, they were as dirty as we are. You can't keep the, the pull dust out, no matter what you do. Oh, you mean we got to turn around and go back? <laughs> Holy mackerel. One car, which seemed to have no problems with reliability, was Bob Watson's diesel Peugeot which chugged its way slowly but surely around the rally route, sounding very like a London taxi. Unbelievable. There was one road that we went through that looked like the bottom of a chasm that a, a, a creek ran through, and that's actually what it was. Uh, we got so involved in that section that Graham got out and took photos of the car in, in areas that if, unless we get photos of it, nobody's ever going to believe us, that's for sure. Finally, the last long home stretch. 4,325 kilometres back to Melbourne, with a short rest break scheduled for Sydney. The rally had got a little easier. Times were more lenient, but there were other problems, mechanical and personal. 11 days shut up in a small enclosed space with two other people. Days of not enough sleep, inadequate food, and a constant battering of the senses. Even the leading team was having its fair share of problems. There were rumours. Holden knew the route beforehand. Red ribbons to mark dangerous corners. Four-wheel drive vehicles at creek crossings. And now it seemed there was unrest in the camp. It was decided by the powers that be that I would reduce my speed and allow Barry Ferguson to catch up. And that did happen. I don't know if any of us are allowed to win. It's a very strange situation. I don't know if Barry's allowed to win or I'm allowed to win. I suspect Barry's more allowed to win than I'm allowed to win. I certainly don't want to upset the apple cart by making the team suffer 
by someone pressing too hard and missing out on getting a one, two, three. The crews were exhausted and tension was beginning to show. White faces and burnt out eyes. It was getting increasingly more difficult not to collapse as they set off down the coast. A car which was proving its worth was the three women in their Volvo. Barbara Beveridge, the driver, was in her first major rally with a six-week-old baby waiting at home. They'd lost a lot of time in the mud early on, but kept going, finally finishing 19th. Fury, an Australian rally champion, and quicker than ever now that the Ford's problems had been solved. But it was too late. Too late for them. Too late for anyone to make up time. The sections were just as hard, but the times allowed to cover the distance were too generous. One of the old faithfuls, an F.J. Holden, which made it to the finish. The forests of Port Macquarie, Southern Cross Rally country. Now, Tight sections run over closed forest roads in the dead of night and time to the second. The sections were fast, but there weren't enough of them for Greg Carr, who was now making a desperate bid to close the gap between himself and the leaders. Oh, yeah, I'm enjoying it. I wish it would go a bit longer now. Now we've got a car sorted out, we, we'll have more time to catch up with you. We're faster. We've got a faster car. Um, it's just that we had a few problems. But you've left, left your run too late. Well, there was no choice. I mean, things broke and they broke. And uh, it's only been until the last few days that we've got them fixed. With rallies, it's a way to sell motor cars to the public. Ford, Holden and even Datsun spend a lot of time preparing these motor cars. The amount of work is unbelievable. The standard motor car, to try and do that event at the speeds that we were trying to do it, it wouldn't make it. The winding roads caused the downfall of early leader Jeff Portman and Doug Thompson. We speed up the track, mate. Why? Um, there was a triangle back on the road, and I think Jeff was driving, and I think he thought there was a car around the corner, and he sort of braked heavily, and uh, sort of went just straight off the end of the road. This is the third time, though, is it? Second. Oh. Another day, another road. The Marlboro Holden dealer team with four service vehicles, a service plane and the Marlboro Holden Castrol light aircraft carrying the press. An open check, an expert organization. But the original car had to be both quick and strong. Or whatever help they might have had, their cars wouldn't have made it. There were many odd cars way back in the field, often slow and often old, but reliable. And although they were missing controls, they'd be there at the finish. And F.J. Holden, Volkswagen beat. It wasn't just a race for the glamour boys. Each entrant had their own story to tell, and each car had its own level of competition with the cars just in front or behind. The organizers had said that it would be an achievement to finish even without completing the course. And there were a lot of crews who would have agreed wholeheartedly as they headed off down the bitumen for a few hours rest in Sydney. rush hour traffic over the harbour bridge. The traffic had held up cars and many had lost time on what was supposed to be a transport section and sensibly the organisers decided to delete the times from the score sheets. Well, if you can't come first, you may as well come last. The newlyweds, John and Sonia Bryson, caused consternation among the press when they were the first car into Sydney's showground. One observant newspaper reporter remarked, that they appeared to have made up a lot of time overnight. John and Sonia came 96th outright, and were the last of the official finishes. But that was still ahead of the 71 cars who didn't make it back to Melbourne. The news media was not covering enough of the vehicles behind third place. All that people heard was Holden, first, second and third, which a lot of people were interested in, in vehicles uh, running further back than third place. A car running a short way back 
was the Mitsubishi Lancer of Ian Hill and Dale Loder. Seventh was no controls missed and winners of their class. It was a tremendous effort from an underpowered motor car. Every race has its rebel, and the Repco had Jeff Portman. Yeah, possibly we did push a little bit hard. Uh, once we'd lost the lead and lost any chance of winning the event, well, we thought we might as well go out and win a few special stages anyway, so we kept doing that. I dare say we'll probably still keep winning a couple. You've come some 17,000 kilometres now. What are some of the funny things that have happened on the way? I suppose... Uh, just a great bunch of grown-up men all wallowing around in mud and that, and cars spread out all over the area and things like that. That, like you know, if our wives knew what was happening, they'd never ever have a go at us about going rowing again. I'm quite sure they don't realise what it's all about. Three women who do know what it's all about. Oh, so far, so good. It's been some rough patches, a um, few tight times on sections, but apart from that, it's been really good. What makes girls go rallying? because they enjoy it too, and if they've got any idea of how to drive, there's no reason why they can't do it as well, I think. And out in the early hours of the morning, to see the rally cars pass through Canberra, they were everywhere, standing on the petrol bowsers and nearby roofs to get a better look at the cars. A constant barrage of flashlights and questions for the rally-worn drivers. Yes, right. Delegate, a fast special stage winding through the dense trees, the last before the tiring drive over the snow-capped mountains. The spectators were all through the forest, sitting in trees, huddled in blankets and waiting around campfires. Greg Carr, a local lad, lived up to his reputation as one of the quickest drivers in Australia, winning fastest time through the forest stage. He'd lost very little time down the east coast. On to the snow. And now they've driven around an entire continent, through every type of vegetation, in 40 degree heat to below freezing. It's been hard, harder than some of them could possibly have imagined. And as the snow gives way to gentle hills, there's a lightning of spirits, as they realize they've almost made it. The final special stage. The last chance for the rally to change. Each driver is taking it differently. Some quick. Others travel slowly and carefully through the slippery corners. Portman passes in his sad looking car. A wild colonial boy managed to nurse his battered car home in 22nd place. finished eighth and ninth, and with the top two-man crews to finish without missing a control. Away through the mud of Bordertown, back through the rain of Beechworth. A circle of places, emotions and times. Friends won and lost, sadness and smiles, and a journey to live on forever in the minds of those who took part. A richly woven tapestry of a story which lasted 14 days. An anticlimactic feeling to match the weather. Despite the tiredness, there's sorrow that it's over. Despite the rain, people have turned up in their droves to watch the cars come into the Albury checkpoint. Brock, the winner. Barry Ferguson, a long-time star, second. Meta, third. Fourth, a dispirited Ross Dunkerton in his Volvo. But he's managed it, an effort of epic proportions against the Holden team. Albury was a 24-hour break to give the crews a chance to rest. Women suddenly appeared from nowhere, wives, girlfriends and families, to welcome home the conquering heroes.
absolutely incredible experience. It, almost something that is indescribable unless you've actually experienced it yourself. You've got to have breaks so that people can get together, not stagger out, oh, Christ, if I've got to bed, I'd have to sleep. No. no, the rest of it was fabulous. If you want to get an endurance test out of it, lock them all in a room, let them starve to death, see you can live the longest. <laughs> It's the most incredible adventure that I could have ever wanted to be in. But it was a pity that it wasn't run on more strict lines because people were able to cheat like hell and get away with it. I can only praise and say it was one of the best organised events I ever went into, if not the best. I'll give credit to the guy that mapped the course out. Fantastic. He picked spots that I'd never seen, and I've been around Australia 12 times, threw it, flown over it, ran on a boat, done everything with Australia, and never seen spots that he dug out. Uh, one place we called the Devil's Marbles, that's where you went along the creek bed for four miles on round boulders. Do you remember that? You'd have to. Look, I love this country. Uh, I love the outback and the people, and I very much want to come back. If they were going to start another race, it'd take us about uh, 24 hours to get ready and I'd, I'd go again. At the finish at the Melbourne showgrounds, uh, the main thing I think was to uh, have a decent meal and probably a drink. A drink probably was the main thing. We'd uh, been without a beer for something like two weeks and being an Ocker Australian, one has to have a beer. So uh, the first thing was uh, a cold tinny.